Welcome. <laughs> We're glad to have a joint meeting with the two boards. Um, when the planning board and the board of commissioners get together, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's the, something going on. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> um, so let me put my glasses on. Okay, we'll have presentation of reports, a video presentation of the P. Ivan Cookhouse. Does this magically happen up here? Since I have the keyboard, do I need to do something? Where do I do it? Desktop? Oh, YouTube. No, this is the computer. Um, next is, did you want to go straight into that, um, Marissa, or do you just want to go into... Um, if they can work out the sound, they'll just tell us when they've got it figured out, and we'll just keep moving through the meeting agenda. Okay. Um, public comp not, Now is the time for public comments. We do encourage you to share with us. Do anybody have any pu public comments? Members of the public are invited to address the Board oh, of good. Commissioners on good. any topic. Public comment is not intended to require the board to answer any impromptu questions or take any action on items brought up during this period. Speakers will address all comments to the board as a whole and not one individual. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Per person or five minutes per group, please come forward to the lectern and identify yourself so that your statements can be recorded. Uh, good evening. Uh, so I'm Reverend Dr. Michelle Lewis, and I just came from the county's, um, the, the, the county commissioner's meeting. So I was just going to read you the comments that I gave there um, so that you don't have to watch the video to get to them. And because I think, because um, it does affect what's going on here in Manio as well.
So I'm, I'm the founder and the executive director of the Peace Garden Project. I pastor the Presbyterian Church here in Manio. And in my free time, I teach at Duke University. But I am from Manio. I live here in the town on Sir Walter Raleigh Street. My family's been here for generations. Uh, we can trace our ancestry back to the indigenous people that were here into the Freedmen's Colony. And I did. I did. Um, and I live near R2 on the zoning map, so I live on that side of Sir Walter Raleigh Street, but I'm concerned about there being a lack of infrastructure to support the proposed growth on Roanoke Island. Roadways through town are already overcrowded. The schools here on Roanoke Island are bursting at the seams. Our community's emergency services are doing their best to keep up, and a growing population means a need for an assessment of our emergency services, not just for the county, but for um, the towns adjacent to where the county is uh, approving these developments, and that would be our town here as well. I do sit on the uh, community police advisory board and spent the last two years as chair of that board. I'm now the vice chair of that board. And y'all, our, our police department is tapped. Um, they used to get a little bit of an uh, off season and some downtime, but they help with the sheriff's department on those calls. And so I think it's really important to name that as a community grows, we're also going to have a growing need for um, public emergency services. And you know, the, the county and the town can't control how many people move into and live in a home after it's purchased. When I was out campaigning for office last year, I knocked on a door on the beach. They let me in. They were all Outer Banks tags. Everybody lived in that house. There were about 15 people having breakfast at that table that morning, y'all. 15 people living in a three-bedroom house. And, you know, if, if 20 people decide to live in a two-bedroom home once the home is sold, we can't do anything about that. Um, so I actually do, I did urge the county commissioners to support the changes uh, to the language that the planning board recommended, which was to remove some of that cluster home language um, out of the zones and to, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken and I'm remembering properly, to also um, those places where there, aren't a, where, not, where there aren't already cluster homes to not approve cluster homes in those communities. And uh, there's a lot to be said about wetlands and the wetlands in our community, and I don't believe in filling wetlands as an environmentalist. Uh, I do have a master's in environmental science that I got from Yale University and still sit on Yale School of the Environment. I sit on their board. And you know, here in North Carolina, more than 70% of the species listed as endangered, threatened, or of special concern depend on wetlands for survival and here along the coast. Wetlands are vital to these aquatic species, and um, they serve a number of purposes, but of these, they are also, they're shock absorbers for storms. So when storms come, when you have wetlands that have been filled in, you know, the water has nowhere to go, and so you have increased flooding. Um, wetlands also help to make sure that we have clean water. I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, I don't want to go over. Are you going to let me keep going? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, and so I, I do recommend impartial environmental impact assessments, and there are lots of ways that we can get to impartial environmental impact assessments, but it's, a, it's really great when we can tap into the schools in our communities to do that, and the schools in our state. Uh, so Nicholas School of the Environment could be an uh, avenue for us to take to do that, UNC Wilmington, North Carolina State University, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, as I did share, I do sit on the, the board for Yale School of the Environment, and so if we did decide we wanted to use graduate students to help with these environmental impact statements, y'all, we have some of the best environmentalists in the world at our disposal to help us do this for our community. And I'm willing to help facilitate those conversations to do that. And you know, most of us won't be here <laughs> in 20 years. A lot of us won't be here in 20 years, right? And because of life cycles, people, people die. Uh, but children and grandchildren will be here in 20 years and we have a responsibility to the children in the community, as many of you may have grandchildren. We have responsibility to the grandchildren, um, uh, y'all's grandchildren. I don't have any kids or grandkids, um, but we do have a responsibility to all those people to make sure that they have a healthy environment, but we also have a responsibility to make sure that the environment is cared for uh, through um, the planning and the building that happens in our communities. That was the abbreviated version, so thank you.
other comments? Nobody wants to speak, nobody else? Y'all sure? Thank you, public comments are clear. The next item on your agenda is the public hearing for the proposed fiscal year budget for 23-24. Um, the budget was presented at the May 3rd Board of Commissioners um, meeting um, and the same rules for the budget um, public comment um, apply as the regular public comment so we would invite um, any um, comments on the budget that there might be from the audience. Uh, actually, I think we need a motion to open that. Yeah, we need a motion. Make a motion there, public hearing for uh, proposed fiscal year budget. Second. Okay. Are there any comments? Okay, all in favor. So this would just be to close the public hearing and then you'll vote on it in June. Okay. And just as a note, we did receive Melissa, what was it, two um, written comments to, uh, about the budget? If you did, I did not receive No, them. in the past. I mean, I think Bob Keeney was one, and then yes, so we have. Yes, we have received some. Yes, uh, yes. yes. Um, yes. At the, we've, we've had three opportunities for public comment, so it's, it's not surprising tonight that after the budget has been presented um, that we don't have any comments. Yes. I just wanted everyone present to know that we've, We've, we've done this a couple of times, so there's a reason that maybe nobody showed up. They've had other opportunities. So now a motion um, to close the public hearing would be in order. Yeah, we good. Commission motion. A motion to close. A motion to I'm close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. And I will second it. Okay. All in favor. Do we have to do all that? Yeah. All in favor. Aye. Okay. okay, so um, the next item on the agenda um, is that we will have the planning board who is already here um, in their seats convene um, and then we'll move on to the, dis the larger discussion. Uh, call the meeting to order to resume the uh, May 9th meeting. The first topic of discussion um, that I thought we'd bring forward um, is the discussion of and review of the land use plan um, policies. So these were included in your agenda packet um, and it's pages, well really 83 and following, which are the, the priorities that were set forth in the land use plan um, and so I'm gonna get to the crux of it here here we go um, so I can actually look at you all so um, you all have had a chance to review these this of course is the um, land use plan that the board has adopted uh, last year and is before the um, Coastal Resources Commission for review, and then it'll come back to you all for um, a final adoption. But this, of course, uh, these priorities are a result of um, community meetings, community engagement, the survey that we did. So these um, priorities that had been proposed by way of that process um, and were approved here, um, and, and really, the, the planning board served as um, the working group that um, helped in the development of, that, of this document. So um, I thought that it was a good time to kind of remind everybody that we've got these stated policies and priorities. And um, if there are any in particular, I, I don't feel like it's useful 
Madam Mayor Pro Tem to read these to everyone because everyone in theory is very familiar with this document. So if there are particular ones that you all want to discuss that are hot topics for you, um, feel free to go ahead and, and highlight those um, and we can just begin to have that discussion. Yes. Anybody have any concerns or any items that they would like to talk about, mention? I have a question. Um, for the natural hazard areas, it's, it talks about requiring enhanced building standards. This is in the actions, number five. What kind of enhanced building standards that are storm resilient are you guys um, talking about? Would this be roofing or uh, stronger pilings? The town has done um, by way of the flood damage prevention ordinance is the regulatory flood protection level. So when the new flood maps came out, um, where gosh, I'm not going to remember the number exactly, but um, hundreds of properties were removed in town from the special flood hazard area, where typically they were required to be built at an eight foot elevation or higher. Um, that is one of those things that. Um, that I would say is one of those higher standards. And, and that, was, that was done um, by working with the county and the other towns. The county, it was really important for us to work with the county because, um, you know, sometimes in Manio, you cross the street and you're in the county's jurisdiction. Back across the street, you're in the town's jurisdiction. Um, but the way that it was crafted is to kind of encompass more than just the building elevation so that if there were new technologies or, or things that came out, we could recommend those um, staff or the planning board um, to, for adoption. Um, but the best example I have is that regulatory flood protection level, which now is, is a pretty standard eight feet or higher. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, when we first talked about um, bringing these two groups together, um, and it was my suggestion to do this, so I feel a little like I should, um, should um, say something about this, but um, the, our planning board gets so many um, development proposals before them, and um, I know that they've, you know, they've, they've wondered about, you know, well, can we only do can we only make a decision based on this, but what about, um, you know, what should we, what other things are there that we could be talking about or that we could uh, put out there? How far can we go? Can we only just, you know, stick with the ordinances here? And so I thought it would be a good idea for us to have a conversation about what kinds of things they're facing as before they ever come to us, because they're our first line of defense in going through this, you know, this book of codes and, um, you know, all the zoning um, questions that there are. So I thought, I know that things have bubbled up that I think we should have a discussion about. And, um, and just where do, where do we as a board stand on that? But what I really wanted to do, I wanted to hear some of the things that, that were reaching you and then um, outline those and then possibly prioritize um, what what items you see, what items we see, because we will need to have them reviewed, um, maybe rewritten, and that would include our um, attorney. So we need to prioritize, it seems to me. So this feels a little awkward because we've not done this before, um, but I, I, I think we, we, because we all kind of talk about it together, but we're here, and I, I really want us to dig into this. For example, if I could just throw this out. Um, one thing that I see is that we've got this wonderful land use guide. It's, it's you know, we spent money on it. We spent a lot of time working with um, our, um, our citizens, our residents, uh, what, about what they wanted. And so how do we make sure that these values these policies are embedded in our um, zoning codes. How do we make sure that that happens? 
And so I think this might be one of the nights that we could start this conversation. I, I would foresee this to be a conversation that we'll have more than once. But, um, you know, for example, in, under local policies, um, maintain a small town character while continuing to keep the town friendly to visitors. Uh, utilize the Manio way of building. Um, uh, prioritize walkability. Uh, foster a connected, accessible system of op open spaces throughout town. These are things that are actually in our local policy. So how do they get from the values, the desires of our community, how do they get embedded then in our zoning code? Can I respond to that? Well, the last two meetings that we've had, we've been going through the actual zoning ordinance and picking out things that are either ambiguous or need to be changed, updated, or thrown out completely because they're outdated. And um, Ben, you can back me up on this, but I think we have to pretty much make all our decisions based on what's in here, otherwise we put ourselves in legal jeopardy. I mean, we can't go beyond what's in there, so what we've been trying to do is go through there and figure out what needs to be changed and then have it looked over by Ben to make sure that it's not going to get us into any trouble and then go ahead and have the revisions made to the ordinance. Right, and there are some just ambiguities that exist. For example, um, one of the things that happened with the Board of Directors, or the Board of Commissioners, is that uh, when we were looking at um, Salt Marsh Landing, and we read the intent of this um, sort of village feel, and that's the intent of B3 entrance, um, zone. So we read that and how, how then do we get that, capture those words and that feeling? Because you can look up what, what does a village feel, feel like and you can look at that, look that up in a land planning definition, but it's hard to get your arms around. But that's actually in our zoning code, it's in our <coughs> intent. So how do we translate that into um, you know, having some teeth in the in the actual. Some of that you can and can't do, like uh, you know the manual way of building. We can always suggest that now. You know, used to be able to enforce that, but other than in Marsh's Light, where you know it's planned unit development, and they have to abide by that because it's in their restrictive covenants. Mm -hmm. um, in the rest of the town, we can always suggest that they you know, abide by those things, but you really can't force their hand now based on what the state's done. So the suggestion in the local policies, um, and this is under actions, just related to what you're saying, is to um, one of the actions that, that was suggested, that's, that's in this, is to pursue a historic overlay for downtown to protect its character and to preserve its tourism appeal. So, a locally designated historic district must be under the purview of a historic preservation commission. So one of the ways that we can do that is if the town starts a historic preservation commission. So that's, I guess, what I'm talking about is how we bring these concepts together um, and put them in our, so we've got it in our land use policy. So we need to, I mean, it seems to me that we need to make those next steps so that what this says is reflected. May I interject? Um, my concept of what we would be doing tonight was pretty simple. We developed a comprehensive plan. We were supposed to go into our ordinances one by one with the commissioners making the suggestion, <coughs> this is the first code we want you, we want you to do B3 first. Um, we w next want you to do B1. I know B1's taken care of, but I'm just for an example. Um, we want a minimum housing standard. We, we want uh, to tighten up our lighting ordinance. Without, without going into a new direction, the whole concept of doing the new comprehensive plan is so we go right into this and start fixing it. Yeah. So without going down too many new avenues, I think we should keep our tasks simple. We're getting a little, that's my concept, is that you will tell us 
And B3 is one we think is important, I can tell you that. And, and the mixed use is a thing that we're a little bit concerned with on, on the plan board. I think we're on the same page, yeah. I do. I think what we're trying to do is merge these two, these two um, documents. So, I mean, it seems to me that it would be a good idea to talk about the, the zoning, the, the parts of the zoning code that are troubling. And you just brought up the, um, the entrance. Yeah, we went, like I said, the last two meetings, we'd gone through and flagged a bunch of different things. But, you know, just to give you an example of some of the things that we found, uh, under the lighting ordinance, section 19, if you look at section 19.5, which describes what you're allowed to have and not have and how it should be regulated, the very first line says that residential structures are an exception. So it doesn't define that. And then if you go back to section 4, which is I think D2, it says that residential structure, the lighting should be done in an acceptable manner, but it doesn't What's define the anything. Yeah. There's nothing specific about it, so it's wide open, and I know I have a pet peeve, a house that was built this past year down the street from me, and the guy lights the thing up. It looks like you need sunglasses when you're driving down the street at night, and he's got all his outside lights on. I mean, I sent Matt a picture of it. It's pretty outrageous. Mm -hmm. And Plus we've got a right nice now, right ordinance. now we don't have any way to regulate that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not clearly defined. It just says acceptable manner, and who's to define what's right. acceptable? That's exactly the kind of teasing out that I think we're talking about here. Right. So and those are the kind of things that we've flagged. I mean, we went through last Tuesday and, and flagged a whole bunch of different sections where we found things like that that need to be looked into and really tightened up. And we have a night sky ordinance. I mean, I, I'm not sure that one <laughs> one house would violate the the ordinance, but I mean, it really should be. Um, yeah, you know, seamless. I mean, there, there's nothing at this point. There's nothing that you can do about it because there's nothing in the ordinance that mm -hmm. says he can't have what he has. Because you know, his opinion of what's acceptable may not be our opinion of what's mm -hmm. acceptable, but it doesn't doesn't clearly stipulate, whereas in, in the lighting section, in section 19, it tells you what candle power and what wattage you can have, all of that. And the other thing we need to do is add LED lighting into that because this is, really you know, it's outdated right now because it's just based on regular old incandescent lighting. I think those are really good points. So from you all, we would like to hear, do you support the night sky ordinance? Would you like to see it updated and um, have the ambiguous language removed from that ordinance that we carry right now? Well, I know with uh, Marsh's Light, I mean, I don't know if that considered public, those posts that have been up, but um, I thought they had to fall within a certain lumen. Um, and I don't know why that wouldn't be across the board through housing, public, private. Um, so yeah, I mean, if it needs to be cleaned up, then I think as a whole we need to look at it. And if it's ambiguous and there's, pol there's words in there that need to be taken out, um, like we ran into with the retail, you know, mm -hmm. it's encouraged. We took that out, so that yes. was a good move. Um, but yeah, I mean. If you guys have concerns on the wording, um, I'm all for it to clean it up. So, but I, I really thought the, the lighting was taken care of under the dark sky. Oh, yeah. The light. Yeah. How a good point. So I'm be right. Oh no, <laughs> my. That's, that's the house. Wow. You, we read the ordinance for the lights at the time, and now everything's changed to LEDs in the last several years, and it's. But Matt, wouldn't that have to fall? I mean, the LEDs are incandescent. The lumens for the street lights were identified as candles. But I'm saying, does that not carry over to personal? It, so, in 
in addition to having the levels of lighting and lumens, if that applies to subdivisions and commercial lighting projects, it doesn't really apply. At, and that's, that's what Chair Goodman's point is, it d doesn't apply to residences, but it, it was a condition in the Marsh's Light special use permit. Um, but there, as the former planner, I often struggled with how to recommend how, where you even start in those conversations because the ordinance isn't keeping with the technology. And so you don't even know where to start because it, with an LED light, you can pick a brightness and a, a wattage or a relevant wattage and it be completely different because of the color of the light too. Um, and so, and, and when you when you do the lighting plan, <clears throat> we're, that's the that's the best tool that we have in determining whether or not a light is too bright or not. Um, but we've also had some issues too, like um, at COA, the entrance lighting that the ordinance allowed was too dim for, for this for what the whatever board approves a, a, a community college, I guess it might be the community college board, but it, whatever, whoever set that standard, our standard was much lower. And so we, they have those nice little canopies that shield that light, but they are brighter under that. And they, they aren't, they don't cause pollution because there's a roof over top of them. But there, there have been some nuances that we've just had to work around um, because the ordinance hasn't kept with lighting technology. Are there other ordinances with communities that we can possibly look at and compare? Oh, I'm sure. I'm Have sure we're not the first person to no, we can run into the look and see if we can find somebody that has a more up-to-date ordinance and then steal paragraphs from that. And there are like lighting engineer groups, associations that have recommendations for these things out there. And then there are also the dark sky proponents who also recommend this. I've, I've looked at a number of those things. Um, they're kind of across the board, but there there's a way forward in making those recommendations to you all. So I think we take this one and put it on the list um, and then we can prioritize later, but this obviously should okay. be on the list since it's, it's on it's on our list it's a, <laughs> because mean, it's we're on working your list. on it yeah and and you know once you um you know staff does the deep dive looking at communities and you all look at it and it comes to us we will have an opportunity to tweak it or whatever so this isn't a done deal whatever we're talking about here this is a conversation yeah right. and, the, and the other thing we've been looking at long and hard well, there's several other things, but one of them is uh, the sewage treatment plant. Uh, we know what the available capacity is, but with all the, some of the outlying parcels outside of town wanting to be annexed, we really need to look at the vacant parcels that are left in town to figure out how much of the available capacity is just going to be needed so that people in town get their sewage before we pass it on to somebody out of town. Wasn't that brought up at one of the meetings? Yes. Mm -hmm. There were going to be some... Well, and calculations done. I can share those with you. I'm prepared to give y'all a little glimpse into that. And we did. We got, uh, we got some numbers here. Um, we do have Josh here tonight, and I'm glad that we'll we'll move to sewage capacity and infrastructure, if that's okay, because um, we do have Josh with us, um, and he can help me <laughs> um, work through this. So, um, one of the things that is important to note that I think. Um, you all have heard from me over the last couple of years, but um, it's complicated, so you've never seen it um, in a meeting. The planning board did it their last meeting, and it's tiny, but I've got it on the screen. Um, is that green engineering did develop a wastewater capacity tracking tool for us, so we have a better idea um, than we have ever had before of where we are um, with uh, getting to our capacity. So. Um, So this is the summary page of the tool, and um, 
you will see that here we are in 2023, um, and Josh, there are a number of inputs here, and Josh has the ability, monthly, Josh reports to the state what, we, what our effluent discharge is. Um, and so we know that number. So one of the inputs that we as town staff do to this tool is that we add that number um, maybe on a monthly basis. <laughs> um, I think this one has been updated through February. Um, so what this shows us is that we are operating at about 54% capacity at the plant. Um, but what this also does is kind of does some forecasting. And um, so this adds about 5%. And then um, we have accounted for the vacant land. Um, and this is a little bit tricky. And so there's, there's a, a special nuance here because um, when we issue a building permit, in theory, this comes off the vacant land, but we know that that flow isn't hitting our system when that building permit is written. So there's a delay there's a gap, right? Um, so we, we keep a list, Becky, Becky <laughs> keeps a list, um, running from what gets removed from this vacant parcel um, list. And we have a general idea, if we scroll down, that The vacant parcels, if you're assuming a three bedroom home only, um, which is the, the general assumption that is applied in this tool. So it's, it's a conservative estimate because we know um, most of our newer homes that have been built in Manio are larger than three bedroom homes. Um, and we can adjust that when we remove them from this tool. Um, so you'll see that most of these are a little more, a little less, but generally the standard of a three bedroom home has been applied to these. So um, there are other situations that I call special situations um, because there are places like the Duke of Dare. The Duke of Dare is a 58 room hotel um, hotel rooms carry a, a, a calculation of 120 gallons per day per room. Um, so they're estimated, if, at total no vacancy, their estimated flow is around 7,000 gallons per day. Um, so that they were offline for a long time, but they didn't come back in. They, were all, they always kept a, an account open. So we can expect that if they do get to a non-vacancy situation that the flow could be about 7,000 gallons per day addition that is going to be be a jump but that we've not accounted for in our vacant land so there are these special situations that I, I note too um, the Elizabethan is being renovated I don't think that they have operated at a no vacancy um, capacity for some time so we'll see when those rooms and I don't know the number of rooms in town because some of their property is in town, some of it is in the county. Um, and then COA, COA actually had a credit of gallons per day because the older school that was demolished that had not been on the system for a while um, actually has a lower, has the new building has a lower flow than the, the older building did. So um, that's what I call the special situation. So this is um, pretty, confusing and complicated, but we are at about 54%. And so in order to make it better understandable, I did this graph. So the existing flow, our 54% is in the gray. And then what, what we have in vacant land and special situations is in the blue. And then 
what we would have remaining after all of that is in the orange. And so the orange is about 15%. Does that um, take it into account the fact that we can only operate at eighty percent of the allotted? No, so this is this is a hundred percent. So that's what I, that was my next point is that um, you you don't this this is a hundred percent because that's how the graph <laughs> that's how the chart works. <laughs> but um, we when we get to eighty percent. That's the time at which that we have to demonstrate to the state in order to stay compliant with our permit that we're making plans for an expansion. Um, so you don't really get to 100% before you have to take some action. And so the number, 80% is 480,000 gallons. So we're at 323-ish. Um, and I would note that when you read the older documents, like the 2007 land use plan, you see um, higher flow numbers, and that you would think they would continuously build. But there have been projects that have been conducted over time in town that that lessen the infiltration and inflow. We call it I and I. Um, like several years ago when the sewer lines on Croatian Avenue were replaced. Like that helps with our I and I numbers to decrease. Um, and then also, I think Josh would remind me at this point to tell you all that we have been experiencing drier conditions. Um, we are fortunate of that. Um, and so that's reflective in these numbers too. But should we have a rainier or a more um, frequent storm season that those numbers, um, the, the daily number of the So that 54% is based on the entire year? Yes. The, the number at the, the 323 is average, average daily discharge based on, you know, the previous 365 days. But I'd just like to point out that, you know, this tool is great um, and like, Melissa said that the numbers represented in the tool represent two or three years of drier weather that we've been experiencing. So just for perspective, you know, if we get, because with our SCADA system, I have a rain gauge connected to the plant up there, so I get to see real flow numbers, I <coughs> see flow numbers change. So with about an inch of rain, we, we see it about an extra 60,000 gallons a day, um, you know, the rainfall as it seeps into the ground and could potentially, you know, come in through infiltration or inflow, I and I, as Melissa said, but, you know, with the drier weather we've seen in the last two years and lower amount of rainfall, that impacts those numbers. So, and also, as she was pointing out, the, you know, the, the vacant land totals, you know, what has already been approved in town, those numbers represent, you know, wastewater that discharging red by our sewer plant flow meter. So as more people, you know, are in town, then those numbers increase as well. So even though, you know, it's like, okay, we're at 52% capacity or 50% capacity or four years ago we were at 58% capacity. And this is a great tool because it can, you know, predict what it could increase by, but, you know, we get a couple of years of heavier rainfall like we saw what, six, seven years ago when we got those freak storms and we had 20 inches of rain and so on, you know, that those numbers will change and as we update the tool, we, we'll see that, but, you know, we really have had a dry couple of years, you know, and again, with all that, all the approved projects, with the vacant is, you know, these numbers can change with only 30% remaining to, you know, to the in smaller pie chart, you know, that those numbers can change somewhat dramatically in a couple of years too, with based on a couple of factors too. So that's, I just wanted to point that part out. So, so the 300, 300 gallons, is, is that the 54%? Yes. So if we add that to the vacant, which is roughly 190, that puts us over 80, doesn't it? Yes. So, 
as it sits now, we shouldn't be annexing any outside areas. And we should also begin development of a plan for capacity upgrade as soon as possible. Because it's a, isn't it, I've been, in the conversations we've had, it's a five to ten year process, right? To actually increase the capacity? Well, for perspective, we just, you know, we'll, we'll reach completion on our shallow back bay pump station project. Um, and from start to finish on that project was, what, four, four years about. We're currently about two years into the UV project plant, along with the resiliency upgrade, and you know we've got two to three more years before that thing's done. You know, I mean, just with with the way the wastewater and in, water industry is, everything backlog, it's taking like a year to get generators and so on and so forth. So it's a long process. However, I will point out that there is remaining capacity, obviously at 50 percent. These just give an idea that even though it sounds, when you say it rolls off the tongue easy, we're at 50% capacity, that means, oh, well, we have 50% left. Really what that means is we have 30% capacity before mandatory expansion study is required by an engineering firm, you know, which is, you know, decision of the board at any point, you know, that can be a study, you know, just based on the plant's age. It, you know, we have a wastewater treatment facility that's 32 years old, so, you know, expected life. We, we keep things updated, we change mechanical equipment, but, you know, the life of concrete structures and so on, you know, only goes so, so far. So, in the next 10 to 15 years, I think that that might be required anyway, just based on the age of that plant, um, not necessarily even for flow. Um, but, you know, at that 80%, that's what's required to initiate the study. However, if you know you get to ninety percent, then a moratorium on development is introduced. So those are just the you know the, the numbers that, that we talked about. What about the infrastructure and the streets and so forth? Because that pipe I'm sure is forty um, years old. Just a second. Michelle, that big sheet of paper that I printed up, do you did that come out here? Okay. So you want to talk about your sure, sure. Just briefly, I promise it will. <laughs> uh, the planning board hasn't heard it. The board, the board is familiar that Josh has a ten-year capital improvement plan, um, and I printed them. I don't know where they wandered off to. So, Josh, Thank you, Michelle. can you educate me? And when we were talking about when we get an inch of rain or two inches of rain, um, and it goes into the gutters. Does that go to the plant, or does that go to outfall? So our stormwater system is completely separate. So we have a 100% separate system. The reason we see an increase you know, in flow of the wastewater treatment plant is some of our manholes have holes in the top. You know, even we have what we call rain stoppers that are insert, plastic inserts that go under a lot of them. You know, but water finds a way. By gravity, water finds a way to you know, work into joints we have we've talked about um, all the old terracotta clay piping downtown and these older sections of town you know those are just what it sounds like clay pipe and they've been wonderful for 80 years they're strong they've lasted you know but at 80 years those are 80 year old pipes period let alone made out of terracotta clay um, with a lot of the manholes that are brick you know so you know, with brick, grout goes and as the groundwater, if you got the structure underground, the groundwater with more rain goes up, you know, it's gonna find the vulnerabilities in those manholes um, over time and that's where the infiltration gets in, is in those manholes. We see it, we're required to, you know, not only clean 10% of our sewer lines here, but inspect our sewer lines. So when we do our manhole inspections, you know, whether it's visual or by way of CC, TV camera or whatever, you know, after heavy rain, you can see these inflow points and manholes. And we've rehabbed, the town has done great, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, the town invested in money to rehab manhole structures on some of these streets when they did water main extensions on water main replacement on Queen Elizabeth and Fernando and so forth. Um, some of these expansions to the system, you know, but you can only put band-aids on these things for some so long, we've 
even in my short time, you know, with the town, I've seen we've paid for epoxy injection in some of these manholes, but you know, these older structures, sometimes the water in the ground, water table outside that structure is gonna find a way to, you know, to get in there. So between inflow points and top of manholes, um, our system, one clean out cap on a residential, <coughs> even if it's on private property past the property line, somebody doesn't have a clean out cap covered and it's in a flood zone, especially downtown. We have a couple of points that you know are in private property that we work with. Um, you know, the owners that have to put a plug in a couple of spots, you know, the sound comes up downtown that if I didn't put a plug just by numbers, you know, we're talking about an extra 150 to 300,000 gallons that we would treat for a, a water event, like a hurricane or a storm. So, but I and I is pretty, every wastewater treatment plant collection system deals with it in some capacity, especially older systems. So is your 10 year plan, <coughs> does that take into consideration repairing some of those items? Yes, sir. I, I was aggressive putting it together. Um, but the 10 year plan would is at least proposed that it's a capital improvement plan, which you know we're required by our collection system permit to have a capital an adopted capital improvement plan in place, which of course is just a planning document, a living document that can change every year. And it doesn't mean just because it's on that document that we have to do it. it, just means that the board is committed to saying, Yes, we understand that these are issues that you know we need to address at some point, but on that 10 year capital plan, I put all of the terracotta clay mains um, and all the cast iron water pipe, you know, the AC water line on the highway. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of old infrastructure um, that needs to be replaced in the next 10 years to 20 years max. So it's all on there. And um, by putting it on the, the 10 year plan, we're able to you know, go after funding sources and, and, and determine if there's you know, ways that we can get help to. Is there a price costs. tag on that 10 year plan? I believe it's north of 15 million. And again, that doesn't, that doesn't address capacity, you know, unless of course that you, that you take the idea that for all those terracotta clay mains that you place, you're putting in, you know, tested by engineers and contractors as they put those new PVC or ductile iron mains and precast manholes in the ground that they're pressure tested and leak tested as they go in. So by theory, you should reduce your I and I, you know, so maybe in a, in a one inch storm instead of 60,000 gallons in, in inflow, we see 30,000 gallons, but I, you know, I can't say what that number would actually be. And we'll, I don't know why it hasn't printed, but I will get you all a copy of this. The board has seen it, but the planning board hasn't seen Josh's 10 year capital improvement plan. It is $15.5 million. Um, but Melissa, you were able to secure uh, funds that were outside of town funds for our sewage infrastructure at times, correct? Like state funds or? Yes. It's so not the, all tax, the, it wouldn't be accurate to, to say that that has to come out of the t all the taxes for me. The last correct. two funding sources, um, or the last two projects, I should say, Shalabag Bay Pump Station and now the UV disinfection um, project. Both of those projects are funded through um, DEQ, um, but it's it's a loan. It's a loan. It's not a grant. Okay. Which we did get on the. Shallowback Bay pump station project, we did get five hundred thousand dollars in principal forgiveness. So the total project at one point one point four. Four. One point four, I believe. We're still waiting on the finalized numbers, but oh that one point four, five hundred thousand um, is forgiven by the state through the clean water money. You know, so it functions similar to a grant, and then of course the remaining balance is then a 20-year loan at zero percent and then we absorb that into our operating costs as debt service and so i think in the next fiscal year there's a thirty-five thousand dollar payment that goes towards that loan and then a, the uv project as we go through the funding milestones would be similar just without the chemical and again by putting all these projects the 15 million 
plus on our capital improvement plan, what that allows us to do is go after funding sources and grants. And I know everybody is aware of the, you know, I don't know the exact term, but the, the Biden bucks or Biden money, or whatever. But of all the extra clean water money that's available, it allows us to go after that, and you do get some partial credit for having it on the capital improvement plan. As the person who is in charge of our sewage capacity, and this may be a question that you prefer not to answer, would you think it would be safe to annex, or would you, would you, would that be, if you're not, if you're not comfortable to answer that, I'm totally fine. <laughs> I would prefer not to, That's you know, perfect. answer where it might be construed as a political answer, but I will say that we're at, you know, 53% capacity. We have remaining capacity. Um, but I think, you know, I just would like to stress to both boards, you know, that it is a 32-year-old plant. And we have a lot of old pipes in the ground, you know, that are 80 years old. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. I'd like to ask you, uh, oh, sorry. Um, we, we talked briefly during the tour about any potential businesses that could be like a catalyst um, for our problems. So a brewery is allowed in the town of Mania. If someone could come in and build a brewery, um, would that be something that would be, that would speed us up dramatically in, in our upgrade process? So and it's a great question. You know, the way I look at that is probably different than the way the board would look at it. You know, if any larger user you know, business that would come in um, is going to take more capacity, you know, depending or not. But, you know, if we bring in industrial users, that would trigger uh, a pretreatment program by the town, um, which is permitting, and then we would have to hire more staff because what that would do then is that would, where we're primarily residential and small business, we don't have any industrial or major industrial users within town limits. Um, whereas, you know, when you do, then we then have to report to the state, but we then become the authority like DEQ, where we would have to inspect, you know, each industrial user and give them effluent limits to what they could discharge into the system because anytime you take an industrial user, you then run the risk of the potential pollutants that could, you know, harm our treatment process where it's biological, but also give us violations. And if we get these violations, then we have to pay the state, and it's, you know, so then we become the authority. So, you know, we don't have a free treatment program because we're not required to right now, but, you know, that, those are good questions. It's just part of the process. Thank you, Josh. Yes, ma'am. I would say we're at the we're at the cusp of the we our capacity is fine I think and it's fine if we get close to building out but if we if the position of board members is they want to annex things and I think that's what they should take I can tell you my opinion is I don't feel like we need to increase our capacity I think we need to fix what we have um, and keep improving what we have but I don't necessarily see the need to increase our uh, capacity by 50% or, or build a new system to take care of um, outside entities water treatment. That's just my opinion. Well, not necessarily outside, but if, if everything inside were to develop, that's what I'm, that's a big red flag to me now that we've seen those numbers. And it leads into the, the next discussion about density. So now I'm concerned that that was, a, that's very um, conservative, those estimates, really, compared to what the kind of development we see around here. You know what's on the table, so now I'm definitely concerned about what we have within town limits. So, mm. well, I mean, I guess you know I agree that we we definitely need to keep an eye on what's available for inside the residents and what they want to build inside the town, but you know that also gives you some leverage on people who want to be in it. I mean, 
how much are they willing to be annexed to improve the system, improve the site. Um, as Jamie knows, and some of the, the older people that have been around here for quite a long time. I mean, if it wasn't for Pirates Cove, um, it would, we wouldn't have what we have. And there was a lot of negotiation going on. And, uh, so they helped quite a bit in, in providing what we've got now, but I mean, it's been a long time. And I'm not into annexing everybody who asked for it. Um, I think it's sometime, it might be near, might be far. You're, you're going to annex. I mean, you're, you're going to have to annex some sort of housing or facilities that provide housing for um, affordable housing or whatever. Um, and there might be some opportunity to bargain with those developers and help them kick in and pitch in uh, for if not anything else to expand the site or improve it put money towards your projects and getting ready to terracotta pipes. So, you know, I wouldn't just count it out. Um, I think it's something we need to look at, you know, as they come in and decide what we can absorb uh, in our plant now. But um, at one day, the site is gonna have to be improved and enlarged. And it, like I said, it might be five years, might be 10 years, we all might be gone. But at some point, the site is gonna have to be increased and enlarged and upgraded. So I just think we need to keep an open mind. If I could uh, piggyback on Commissioner Cosol's comments. Yeah, I would agree with that. But the planning board doesn't really deal with dollars, those types of things, and ask Josh his, his opinions. Josh's the kind of guy, you give him the money and the time, he'll make it happen, whatever you guys want to happen. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so those are all political discussions, but you did say uh, something that we need to talk about is uh, affordable housing. That was on my list. That, uh, what we're looking for basically is, is the numbers. You know, not to say because we don't know dollars, dollars and cents, but what is it you want from us? So you said affordable housing. But how do y'all feel about, where do y'all want to go with that? We have an affordable housing ordinance that, again, is outdated. It came before the recession, and we had to cut it drastically because the affordable housing rate was less than the market rate at the time, and now that's flip flop again. So um, that needs to be revisited. But I'd like to ask your opinion on what would would you like to see with that ordinance or a new ordinance or, or something? And then we have that term, term is good for terms. We say affordable housing, but of course that means something different to everybody. So what what even do you consider affordable housing? I think it's even more complex than that, Jamie, because I I think. I think that's a good question. Um, and affordable housing did come to the fore when we asked in our planning, uh, our comprehensive plan. When we asked the community, do you want to, is affordable housing important to you? No, I wasn't at the very top, I will tell you that, but it did bubble up. However, the other thing that really bubbled up was density. And what folks said is they wanted low density. So. How do we fit those two pieces together? Well, I mean, I think there will be eventually some apartments, um, either either it's in the county land, and we have to make the decision on, you know, do we want it, do we not? I think Roanoke Island and Manio itself probably has more affordable housing um, than anywhere in Dare County. Um, I don't think anybody has talked about putting it in Southern Shores. I don't think anybody's talked about putting it in Kitty Hawk. I think we all know what happened when they started talking about putting it in Nags Head. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it, and I think we're all for it and we all need it as business owners and, you know, just for the compassion to have people live in nice places that they can afford. Um, and I think, at some point, we need to work with the county, maybe it's not what they wanted, uh, but kind of mediate in between. And, um, but I would feel more comfortable, you know, if Josh felt more comfortable and Melissa felt more comfortable when the time comes and they ever, if they ever, give us the application. But I mean, you know, Roanoke Island has got the land and 
people want to live on Rennick Island. Um, and I welcome it. Um, but I just, I think we need to bargain. You know, if they want it that bad, the developer's going to have to put up some money and increase the capacity and help us improve our sewer treatment plant. Um, so I think, you know, leave the door open and see what we can bargain with and come up with. And um, possibly we can make it work and it wouldn't be a huge expense on the town itself. The other thing we need to do with our affordable housing ordinance, um, it's written for purchase of the property. And on Salt Meadow Landing, they were trying to apply it to rental. No need to waste time on this unless you're going to get the legislature to change the law. <laughs> there's, a, there's a rent control pro prohibition statute in North Carolina, and the general consensus is that you can't regulate you can't regulate rents at all, including affordable housing as well as the government. So it would be homes for purchase only. That could be, people could develop homes for purchase as affordable housing, or we should not worry about, our ordinance has to change dramatically. Is that, which of the two are you saying? There are potential changes that need to happen to the ordinance. And there are potential changes that are policy questions about like how much benefit would you want to give somebody for providing affordable ha affordable units? But it all has to deal with sales and not um, not rentals. If if I build a, if I buy an affordable house and I live in it for five years and then I decide to sell it, is that still being sold as an affordable house? It depends. So I could sell it for market rate. I don't remember what our ordinance provides. I think it, it provides something in there about covenants, but that's what's typical is that there's a restrictive covenant placed on the property that it can't be so, you know, it has to be treated that way in the future. Um, but it really depends on whether or not what that says. It could be, because it could go beyond what's required. It could be whatever's required. And if there's nothing in the ordinance currently, then it would be no requirement. And there, I can't, there I, isn't, as it was originally written, there was, but there is no longer that requirement. So they can sell for market rate. And that has happened. Yeah. yeah. I'm, um, when we talk about affordable housing, one thing I know is that if you have density that's, and I live in an affordable, I live in Roanoke Village. It was built as like probably the premier affordable neighborhood. You know, we're all, police teachers things like that but you cannot have a really low density and affordable housing so if you I understand the push for low density but you cannot have an entire community of single-family homes if you want people who work for the town work EMTs it just the dollars don't add up so um, whether it be um, the county or whether it be Mantio allowing um, a little bit more density in certain areas. We've got to allow for people who work in Manio to live here. We cannot forget this. So that's my and I was actually going to bring that up. In, in our ordinance, um, in section 412, it talks about the eligibility of households. It's, and it, it prioritizes, it, in the first section, it's to residents of the town, employees of the town. Um, that's all legal. I, I, I was running into, uh, when I was looking into this personally, I couldn't find a lot of law supporting that we could actually say who goes into the housing. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And my expectation, I don't think I want to tell you in an open session what the answer is. Um, okay. But to that point, I would point out that <clears throat> who determines that eligibility right. is um, the I'm looking at this. so that there are two ordinances there's one in the codified and one in the zoning and in the codified it doesn't specify but I believe I mean in the zoning it doesn't specify but I believe in the codified it may name the Outer Banks Community Development Corporation which no longer exists so we have no ability to vet these applications if they were to come in. Yeah. So that needs updating. 
We'll put that on the list. <laughs> yeah, we went through that with Salt Meadow. We, when they were looking at I remember. the agency that um, checks in to make sure that they maintain affordability no longer exists. There's a lot of things that we discovered in Salt, Salt Meadow Landing. Well, I know in Kill Double Hills, that development with the condos or apartments um, was sold on being affordable. And I think they got through some loopholes to be able to develop what they developed. And when it finally got developed, it was $1,300 for a yeah. one bedroom apartment. So, you know, I don't know what's legal and what's not legal and what you can hold them to. Um, but, you know, those are things we need to nail down to make sure the visibility and the affordability. It was the same thing with Salt Meadow Landing where they, um, there was a stipulation that um, rent could be increased, was it 4% a year? And so it took like two and a half or three years, three years for it to go from affordable to market rate. And we're talking about a two or three bedroom house that would go within, what, three years to $2,000 a month. Rent. And that was a condo. Yeah. Not a single those were, yeah. Apartments and condos are the top of the Right. Um, I, I would like to point out um, when we talk about density, um, a way in my mind that I've been able to make it more um, practical practical um, is bad just looking kind of around town at what we have. Um, so Cypress Cove, Cedar Bay, and the Flats were all developed under the affordable housing ordinance that gave that, um, that density bonus for the percentage. Um, and those lots I'm trying to find it in the ordinance now. Um, the minimum lot size is, is 6,000 square feet. Um, and so when, but then when you look at um, properties in Roanoke Village, those are even smaller than that. And so, um, you know, from, from the zoning perspective, um, there, there are complaints that happen when you do increase that density and you, you put more people in that smaller space. Um, and we do get more of those complaints from Roanoke Village because um, you know, they, they do have more parking problems than the other places, um, you know, and those kinds of things. And so I, I just wanna note that, that you know, there, if you go six units per acre, that is about 7,500 square feet per lot, um, which is the, the general um, size lot in town. Um, and so I, I just wanna note that because it's, it's not, like the six units per acre relates to something and it's that lot size. And um, I think that's an important note to make when you're talking about these numbers because it's not arbitrary, it's, it's directly related to the lot size. How about co the condominiums? In our town. So I don't know because obviously they were built before I worked for the town, but it's my understanding that those were built, um, they came in as planned unit developments, which are no longer part of the uh, zoning ordinance, but they used to be. And I've, I've, I've never seen those ordinances or how that happens, but it, it was certainly much higher. Uh, you can, you can. See, I just don't know what that number is. Well, I know some of our ordinances allow for eight units per, per eight units per year. I agree with you. I think we should definitely decrease and keep it at six, um, especially with the general residential district. And also the residential with modular homes. They're both right now at eight units. I wanted to propose an additional change and get the planning board's feedback on this um, since I'm new to this. Um, I talked to Melissa about it in the town attorney. Melissa gave me an interesting example from something she learned in school about the budgeting around these buildings. But 
I was thinking that we should propose um, or we should require under structure parking. I know that that increases development costs dramatically, I've been told, but if we're already um, running into issues in these areas where parking lots are full and parking's an issue, then if they're getting that bonus, that RLI that everybody loves, they're chasing that, then let's, um, let's require that they do underbuilding parking. Or really the development issue. Or that, yeah. But I was just thinking that the, it had the Evans building, for example, had under building parking, that would have been a couple more parking spots downtown. Um, and since parking is so important and comes up a lot, um, I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on under building, under structure parking. The one problem with that is that requires a fair amount of steps to get up to the house. So if you have a elderly couple, you're now talking about putting a elevator in and the expense of that. So I, I think you have to keep that in consideration also. Are you talking about commercial? Well, really anywhere we have density bonuses like this, affordable housing or dense would be an interesting place for it. So I know at one point we had talked about if we allow under building parking, that you would maybe give them a um, variance on how high they could build. You know, as a, what it is now, Melissa, is 36. 36. 36. 36. So, I mean, if, if they put in underneath parking, you know, maybe you could give them a, an exception or whatever. And I'm not talking about everywhere, but I'm talking about like in a commercial district and, um, like Ruth was saying, uh, the Evans building. I mean, it would it would have made a lot more people um, a little more easy about it than taking up the whole property and just saying park where you can. What did we do for the condos downtown? So there's sure. underbuilding parking. Yeah. So did we did we take it from uh, did we take the 36 feet from the the living floor, which is what I think the first living floor. Oh, for oh. the old Tom property? No, the, the how long, right, how long yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I don't know. But I, my, my, my concern in that point, and, and I don't think that it is a real concern, is I think about life safety things. Like I want to make sure that our fire department can get up above the top of that roof, whatever height that roof is. Um, and because we know we have these structures in Pirate's Cove, I don't know the exact height of them, but I would venture to say that we probably have some ability to, to reach that life safety height. Yeah. They're 36 feet. And, and so that, that's where my concern is that sure. our fire department can access the tops of those buildings. And I think that we could. Um, I just don't know what those, I've tried to measure it on Eagle Viewer and all sorts of stuff. I, and those plans are, I mean, we only keep plans six years previous, so we don't have those building plans um, to be able to know. But that we could probably find notes in old minutes. I don't, maybe planning board minutes where they would have talked about the waterfront condo building and the height there. I, not to go on a tangent, but I think the top plate thing could be addressed. You just brought it up the 36 feet to the top plate. So that's, uh, there's some room to fudge the height of something but a 36 foot top plate because you can build a 36 foot top plate building and then put a 2 2 pitch on it. Yes. Or you can put a 12 12 pitch on it, mm -hmm. which you're an engineer, so a 36 foot top plate would go to a 46 foot tall building. You know how wide the building is. 12, 12 you yeah. you yeah. can be up there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that uh, could be addressed too. There's some kind of language that could. Uh, and, and where we measure from, do we measure from? Uh, yes. so do we, we Kicker. Yeah, I think that. You could yeah. still apply. Or base flood, if we measure from base flood elevation, that would be pretty universal. Um, or at whatever height above or below base flood. Or, but I think we'd establish where, where we're measuring from to start at. And then I think the top plate thing needs to be uh, cleaned up a bit. Um, because I think that leaves a lot of room for variation for somebody to take advantage of that if they want to. And we just wrote language, Ben, in our um, our village, what B1 village, 
um, the language for the definition, right, Melissa? In the yes. So now right. in B one, the building height is measured from the living floor, the first floor. Yeah, first living floor. I think there's a limitation on living space above the top floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just we just approved that like in January. That's when we approved in January. Do you have the language? Ma'am, do you have that language? Um, I looked it up earlier today. Um, I know where to find it quickly. Because this was one that we just approved. How, what were some of the other items that you were? Minimal housing standard is one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to look at because there is not one now. And in talking to Woody and to Fred, they can't, you know, somebody steps through a porch floor because the boards are rotten. They don't have the ability right now to go in there and say, hey, you got to replace that before somebody gets hurt. So they can't, you know, if something's deficient on a property and they haven't applied for a building permit or anything, they said they have no jurisdiction to go in there and say to somebody, you've got an unsafe situation, you got to correct it. So we were looking at, uh, you know, how that possibly might be able to be tightened up. What does 160D say about it? There's, there's four or five different silos of, is what I call them, of dealing with unsafe and minimum housing and then how that works with commercial structures. And all of them are built into 160D now, but they're all things that I've dealt with in other towns on numerous occasions. Um, for actual safety violations, safety things up to a certain level, there are statutory provisions that you can deal with condemnation of portions or all of a building. Minimum housing, is the, probably the lowest standard. So mm -hmm. the highest standard is gonna be uh, at, a, at a provision where something is in, in imminent danger to the public, right? And in that, the higher the standard, the more action you can take with less due process. So if the building's getting ready to fall on, some, on, the, on the sidewalk or on the street, and you can engineer to say that or you can show that, then you may be able to go over there with a crane and fix it, knock it down deal with it, make it safe. And then as you move farther towards minimum housing, there's a lot more due process built in because you're looking at a lot lower pr levels of problems. You're looking at uh, how walls are made, whether or not they're defective, and whether or not uh, heat sources are proper and things like that. And all of them can result in demolition or repair and potentially liens and things associated with that. And they all also result in costs to the town that are sometimes not recouped in order to follow the right. processes. And That's so right. it's important to, it, most towns have some sort of mechanism for minimum housing uh, that I've dealt with. But it's important for my history, sadly I've litigated this more than most people, um, <laughs> but it's important that you know ahead of time that there are potential costs and processes that go into dealing with it that are um, cumbersome um, that if you really want it it's fine but you just need to know that those costs and things are there too and that you may not recruit those costs and you need to plan for that for each so for instance minimum housing enforcement deal with a house that everything's fallen in the roof has fallen in uh, you go through the process to have a hearing about it and then you decide you know the building inspector has the hearing and then orders the demolition of the building well there's nobody there who's going to demolish it they're already letting it fall down so then you've got to go demolish it and then you've got to pay all the tipping fees the demolition costs and what you get is a lien for your costs and for my time and doing the title to find out who to actually gets notice so all of a sudden you end up with a ten thousand dollar bill between me and the demolition costs and the other costs associated with fixing this problem 
and then you have to go through the process to <coughs> perfect and sell your and uh, have a sale of the property to get the lien back, which here it might not be as bad as in other communities, but in other communities where the value may be a little bit depressed, you end up owning that property, and then you have to figure out what to do with it, and you're out whatever costs that you've had. Here, the value of land might make it so that someone would show up at the sale, but I've held, I don't know, probably 25 minimum housing or similar sales over the years and never had anybody show up. <laughs> you know, and and the, the, the community that I was dealing with always ended up owning the property and then having to figure out, okay, now we have a piece of property, now we got to go mow the we thing. Yeah, and, right, right. And, and so uh, it, it's not a bad thing to have one, but it's not uh, the dream of all of a sudden we can fix every house in town sure. and, and make everybody clean everything up without any cost. It, it's that additional thing is there. So just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Minimum housing wise, though, I, I saw in the, the minutes that you also wanted to talk about with regard to commercial structures. Yeah, because we, we ran into issues with the old Weeping Radish property when it sat there and the roof was falling. That was a case of the roof falling in and trees growing yeah. through the buildings. And and so there's else. another there's another silo that fits that. That's that the General Assembly didn't even you couldn't do it until maybe ten, I don't know. I'm getting old now, but it might have been 15 years ago. But certainly 10 years ago they added that in. But it's a very similar mechanism to the minimum housing. But it's another. It's another statutory, you know, it's another ordinance section, it's another ordinance chapter that has to be there and has to be thought about, about what you want the standards and things to be. So but all those can be done, and I've done them for, for others, and there are other good examples. Of, you know, for minimum housing, Edenton may be the newest one that I can recall dealing with. For the commercial structures, uh, Hertford's got one. Um, so th there are places to start for this. Would that be a good thing for the planning board to bring those ordinances to the planning board to look at and see sort of first step? Uh, sure. I mean, it, it, procedurally, there probably wouldn't be many changes to them, but you may have some changes in what you want. So the way the statute sets it up is you've got to do this per you've got to adopt an ordinance that has a particular set of procedures. And so the procedures are kind of locked in, but they are part of the ordinance. So you, you got to spell it out right so it matches the statute. And then there's some boundaries as to what standards apply that trigger different parts of the ordinance. And that's where there's more policy consideration. Mm -hmm. But that, again, there are also limitations there that have to be. There are a lot of dream policies for that, but there are uh, there are boundaries on on how far you can go. So what what I asked, and I have met asked Matt to run these for you. We started with Article 11, and part of Article 12 from 160D. Is that a good place to start, or should we start? I would skip over that. That, that that's going to be your procedural stuff primarily. You're going to want to look at the standards parts of those other ordinances because the procedure parts you're just not gonna have a whole lot of room. I mean, if you're starting from the bottom and you're building the ordinance rather than cutting and pasting from somewhere else, then I would start at the statute. That's where I started to draft the one for Edenton and to draft the one for Hertford that exists. But with those already in existence, you could probably start there. And But what you're really looking at is leaving the procedure parts alone and adjusting the standards and the policies for, for, for where you want things to be triggered at. Sounds like a, a reasonable thing to do. Because it, it, it's one of these ordinate the statutes that they spell out the procedures in such high detail that I'm always stunned that they say you can adopt an ordinance that does these <laughs> things. Why don't you just say here's the procedure? I, I don't know why oh, the General right. Assembly does that. <laughs> they make you duplicate what they've already done, but they're very detailed in the statute in terms of what the procedures are, and so the ordinance is going to have to track that in terms of procedures. Well, you'll all be getting a copy of that anyway. <laughs> I got another uh, thing I wanted to discuss, since we're all here. Um, the sidewalks. We've been talking about sidewalks a lot, and everybody's really um, jazzed up about us fixing the sidewalks. 
and I've learned how difficult it is now and um, that we have to have legal basically tell us what we own and what we don't own um, and there's easements um, and we have no say over what poles go back in the sidewalks because we don't actually have a contract with utilities that's the state I've, I've, I've had a little bit of an education crash, crash course on this but um, until we figure out what we own and or acquire the sidewalks for our repair because um, I think Melissa, can, can you give us the update from Robert Hobbs about the, the lane that was in dispute and what his advice was to us about this one particular issue, which was kind of... Sure. Um, okay. So, I've been advised that the town, even, even with um, the easement that exists, that the, I've been advised not, for the town not to be making the repairs at that property. So that got me thinking and looking at um, other towns ordinances for the, the standards for their um, their sidewalks and I was thinking um, because of the public health hazard my grandmother has tripped twice on sidewalks and so I, I'm starting to get really passionate about it. Um, uh, I'm thinking that maybe we could do some kind of language that requires them to be repaired, be brought up to our standards within a period of time, 12 months, we could be very <laughs> lenient about it. Um, and or include a fine. Um, I, I'm not sure what you guys, I just want to throw the idea out there because I'm thinking that um, it's going to be difficult to get these sidewalks. It's going to be a multi-year process, I understand that, but I just, I think that um, if there's a sidewalk that we don't own that is a definite public health hazard, um, instead of the town incurring the cost, we could put it back on the, the landowner if they do not want to turn the sidewalk over. I just, I know it's a complicated issue, but I want to just get some, um, some advice from you guys. Can, can we do that? that? I don't know. It's not a no. It's not a no. I, I, I would have to look at it and... There's always uh, a struggle when something changes and make someone have to do something that they didn't have to do the day before. It, it's easier to deal with stuff like sidewalks when you are requiring it as part of a new development, part of a building process, but requiring somebody to go and do something with something that already exists always adds some complexity. And I'm more familiar in the zoning concept, so if it was like signs or lights, things like that, then <coughs> you either um, have to allow them to continue, and if they change them, then they have to fix, you know, then they have to meet the new codes, or you have to go through a process to develop an amortization schedule and give them a certain amount of time based on uh, the economic value of those sort of things. Um, I know that's how it applies in the zoning context. I'm not sure exactly how that applies in in a just in a true police power context, you may be able to accelerate that in a police power context, um, but uh, I would still have to look. Do you guys have any thoughts on the general idea of something like that? Any opposition or? Yeah, I like to spend more time. Yeah. Okay. I've got other. Yeah. I don't have a general answer right now, but I yeah. do. Would would like to take some more time. I just see, um, I was looking through um, my entire book, and it talks about regulating um, pedestrian greenways, drain drainage ditches, and parks, but I don't see, I was scanning for sidewalks, I don't see, I don't have any opposition to that. Um, ben is the legal guru, it's, it's, if, he, if he guides us in that, I'm sure all of us would fine with that. Well, I think you have done a lot of research, and I know you're meeting with um, the power company, you and Sherry, um, and walking the sidewalks. But what I, it's just hard for me to believe, and I know enough to be dangerous, but I don't see how they could put telephone poles in the middle of a sidewalk and then spend the money to have ADA ramps going up on these sidewalks 
and the <laughs> wheelchairs <laughs> you can't go around, can't go around them. No. And I mean, I'm, and even us, if, if we text them and you're not looking up, you run right into the telephone call. It's just bizarre. And I don't know who, you know, our Department of Defense is the one who's in charge of ADA, which I don't know if that's true or not, but it might be. But I mean, it seems like there would be some money or some kind of policy that would make them either put them underground or move the poles to an area and such that people can actually get down the sidewalk without riding out the street and coming back up on the sidewalk. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of bizarre. Try getting a wheelchair around. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Getting on the road. <laughs> And the biggest thing from Dominion, that the takeaway just to share with the planning board, was um, Sir Walter Raleigh is our most complex street to put them underground um, because there's a large service there that goes to the pumping station um, in front of Malcolm's building and the Evans building that would actually have to go, um, that would be a small SUV-sized switch box um, that would need to take up one and a half stop parking spots on Old Tom um, in order to make that um, entire street go underground. So that's... A complicated situation. Uh, Budley's a little less complicated. Everything else is much easier from Lord Essex down, um, but that Sir Walter Raleigh is a complicated one because it takes a large switch box. So. And the town probably owns some of the properties in Budley, which then means we don't have to right. negotiate yeah. for that. Yeah. We've made it easy with, with whoever owns that area, which we know. So. Yeah. But what you're Pardon. saying is they could do a lot of the site. It's possible that they could put a lot of the poles underground. They could do everything from Lord Essex East. Yeah. Every single pole can go under, with the exception of perhaps one. Um, and it would require a transformer at Mount Olivet on that area, um, and then one poten potentially near the, near the old Evans house, and then that switch box, which would be the largest piece there for the pumping station. Yeah. But everything can go underground. The only downside of that because we have all our utilities underground in Pirate's Cove, is those transformers are on the ground. So when the water comes up in a hurricane or a flood event, it trips all the transformers and you gotta wait for them to come out and reset them. And they don't always reset right away. And sometimes they're wet inside. And they can't get them to go back on for several hours. They did mention that. Did. Dominion did mention mm -hmm. that to us as the downside, but there were so many other upsides. Yeah. Uh, are, are there grants available to do that? Did they say that? Potentially. He listed about six different reasons why um, we could maybe add it to our hazard mitigation plan. Um, you know, there's definitely some public safety issues. Um, and then there's perhaps resiliency. There, there's a, a myriad of options for grant funding. Um, so I think the hazard mitigation plan seems like the most interesting. And we've talked about adding that to the plan. So it's not... It's off the table. We just need to discuss it with everybody and see what you know. See what the consensus is. Maybe do a pilot down Budley or something. The easiest street. Yeah, that would be the easiest yeah. pilot. Yeah. And I know between these two boards, you know, and it comes up, but I mean, it, but at some point it has to be addressed, and we all know it. I mean, it's the traffic. I mean, we have to get serious about the traffic plan. Either get the right people in the room to discuss it. I know um, we've seen one. Uh, it might need tweaking, but um, at some point, I mean, even if we came up with a magic bullet tonight, I mean, it would be years in the making. And I mean, pulling up to that main road, I think we all know, it is, it's a mess. And it's um, going to get worse. And it's going to get worse. The more popular Manio gets um, by the summer, it's, it's, each summer it just gets busier and busier and busier. Mm -hmm. And I mean, not even 10 years ago, you'd about lay out in the street and not get run over for a while, but it's just, it's something that has to be tackled. And I don't know what the starting point is, and I don't know, because um, you're always gonna have opposition to certain areas, pe taking people's land. Um, but at some point, it's, it, it has to be done. It's one of those issues that I think this board and the planning board has to work together on and maybe some outside people. Um, but at some point, it needs to be looked at. You are absolutely correct. And what Michelle said um, enters into it a lot because we have lots of developments that have just been, 
you know, been put in in the last couple of years, all in, in the Dare County part of Roanoke yeah, Island. Right. But it doesn't lessen the traffic or the kids in Manio Elementary School. All the services that we use are heavily impacted. So I would think it would have to be also that the county commissioners or the county planning board would have right. to enter into it. Sure. What's the, the, that, that uh, development off Old Airport Road, I think that's 50 homes or something like that. Yeah. So there's 54 people plus yeah. traveling through Manio. We've been talking about that, Melissa and I, um, that uh, because we're on the um, Albemarle Regional Planning Organization, we're um, on that, and transportation is what they do. And so just the idea of getting a study, I know we did that study back in 2006, but that was a long time ago, and there's all these new things that you're just talking about. So um, Alyssa and I, because I am, I am on the Transportation Committee, I think it's Daryl and me, so we're trying to at least figure out where we can get some money to do a study um, that would be contemporary, I mean, would be current instead of that old one. But maybe they could still use portions of that. But Melissa, you would talk to Angela um, uh, Walsh. I'm not, I, I have not been able to catch with her, but um, I was looking just now to see if all her projects were listed in the APRO They, we know it happened, um, and there were consultants involved. Um, so I don't know, if, I, I don't know the funding source of those, but that could that could be a good starting place as well. Yeah, that sounds good. So we've and, got some options, and and there may be a greater willingness um, now that people's lives are impacted by the new growth, as was mentioned, and by more tourism, sort of our new normal. So maybe maybe there'd be more of a willingness to try some traffic relief than there was back in 2006. Uh, the other <laughs> item we discussed at our meeting was uh, stormwater, uh, trying to clean up the stormwater. It's, uh, look at, I know there's a problem, they do have some uh, sediment traps in some of the stormwater drains, but they have an issue trying to clean them out because every time we get a little bit of wind and it pushes the water level up, the water comes back up the storm drain and they can't put the vacuum truck down there and pump it out because all this water is floating around. <coughs> um, so there are some other different types of devices that can probably be put in there, so you probably should look at that because uh, keeping shallow back bay clean is uh, definitely a priority because it's a primary nursery area for the fish, so uh, fish and shellfish. So that was something else we discussed. Anybody got any comments or discussion? I think, well, I think that would be the perfect opportunity to talk about some kind of uh, living aquaculture reef in Shallow Bag Bay. Um, water is going to run there no matter what we do. Um, we try to clean it before it gets there, but we can also clean it while it's there if we uh, maybe work with some grants and some institutions to work on a uh, living reef project in the bay, like oyster reef. Um, Chesapeake Bay has done it. I think it's a opportunity for us to partner with some of the um, local entities to yeah. um, see what we could do there. They did uh did a bunch, I know uh, Linky Silver put in a bunch of it for one of the, the contractor for the bridge when they did the new Bash Knight Bridge. 
they had to put one in uh, between uh, Channel Marker 55 and the uh, fishing center. There's an area there that they had to put in a whole new oyster reef. And, uh, you know, it was one of the mitigation measures for being allowed to build the bridge. But, uh, yeah, we could certainly look into something like that. I think the Coastal Fed has a, can help with that. Right? Yeah, and, and there's grants available, too, because I know our Anglers Club, uh, we got a significant amount of money from the Coastal Recreational Fishing License Fund. And we put an artificial AR-165, which is just eight miles south of the inlet, and it's right in state water, not quite two miles off of the beach. And we sunk three tugboats and uh, I think about uh, 700,000 pounds of concrete pipe and concrete structures. And the thing's covered with fish now. Wow. Is but, that uh, something that can be incorporated into the proposed attenuator that one of the developers has talked about putting in um, Shell Bag Bay? You know, probably put something like that right in front of or right behind the attenuator, depending on what kind of structure it was. I think that might be a trade-off. You, know, you mentioned that, like a, a, if attenuators are allowed or if there's going to be some kind of adjustments on, on attenuators, then uh, maybe putting a caveat in there where it has to be a um, oyster shell or some kind of structure like that used to buffer those attenuators bulkheads. Yeah, the, the, the attenuators get to be a pretty tricky thing with CAMA because you got to have openings to allow the water to circulate through and that affects how efficient the attenuator is. But, uh, but, you know, they will allow you to do, or definitely allow you to do a reef type structure. I would note on the stormwater discussion, um, we've seen it with a recent um, development application, but you know, in adjacent to the bay, we have two primary nursery areas, um, and I think that our ordinance could be improved in a way um, where there's direct runoff into those to Doe's Creek or to Scarborough Creek that um, we require some kind of pretreatment um, so that there's not that direct runoff. Um, which would, you know, protect those primary nursery areas better. I, I don't know, the state rules are, unless you're an engineer, kind of complicated. <laughs> um, but I, I, what, I, what I don't believe in my review of that is that um, we, our ordinance is um, on par with the level of, um, I guess, protection measures that we could be taken. Um, and specified, you know, really clearly in our ordinance for those primary nursery areas. Um, and so that's that's a recommendation that I would make to you all, but that, that would require, um, you know, having some professional services involved in helping guide us there too. Um, but I, I think, you know, rather than just a direct stormwater pipe into the bay, oh, yeah. have, <laughs> yeah, have there's some not even natural tension <laughs> basin yeah. or something to get all the solids out of it before it's released. Yeah. And, I, and this would affect me personally, but I'm okay with, because those uh, primary nursery areas are just Doe's Creek and Scarborough Creek, correct? Like, it leaves a gap in the middle of Shell Lake Bay, which is where I live. So I'm okay if we extended the, the regulations to encompass all of Shell Lake Bay, even though it, because where I live is not a nursery area, um, but to the right of me is and to the left of me is. So I'd be okay with uh, increasing that to cover even my house. <laughs> and that's something that's a state mandated thing so we couldn't we can't necessarily make it a primary nursery area but uh we could say uh just put the restriction on it that on the, the, the runoff had to be treated pre-treated yeah. so that the same as it was going to a nursery area was there higher restrictions for the primary nursery area still more off than non-primary not in the town's ordinance, but from the state's guidelines, yes. We could adopt something similar to the town, yeah. the state's, and just adopt theirs. Because you're right, it's like the end of this. It's not like the worst case right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, the planning board, planning board members, comments? 
start with comments. Fields? Dave? No, I thought it's been good so far. Nicole? Um, I watched your meeting, your last meeting. Ruth Jane, I love your comments about, uh, about uh, the Mania statue. I thought that was awesome. Um, I learned a lot about the police program because of the police program that one of our officers just went through because of you, Eddie. I didn't know what it meant or what it was for. Um, and I also would like to say that um, the citizen who spoke about the George Howe drainage is so correct. It goes uh, to both sides of George Howe. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of drainage problems. So Phil was exactly correct about that. Jamie. I don't have anything else. I've said enough tonight. Okay. The yellow is done. Yeah. Is there a motion for adjournment? Do I have a second? I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Meetings adjourned. Comments, then, um, Commissioner Mann. Uh, no, thank you all for having a joint meeting with us. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Lister. Yes, I, I'm so glad. I hope this will be the first of many. I think we've got a list. Someone's got a list. You've got the list. Great. So we've got a lot of work to do. We all got lists. Yeah, we've all got lists. So it's the first of, I hope, more meetings. Thank you all for coming. I just want to thank you guys. This exciting i'm really uh looking forward to see what comes out of it and i love learning from you guys i love that everybody will always answer my questions and, and help me understand things deeper so um i'm really excited to hear about commissioner man pushing the, the shallow bag bay uh cleanup project because uh, uncle mark was passionate about that in our, our community that was in our land use plan a lot of people requested that and i thought how will we ever clean up that bay when we discharge into it but there is a way and so maybe in 20 years his son Nash will be shellfish down there. So we'll see. But yeah, thank you guys for this. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I just echo the respect for you guys coming out and meeting with us. And uh, I think it's good. And like Sherry said, I hope it's one of many. Um, but I do hope that we nail some of these things down and just don't let them drift off, uh, especially the traffic, because I think that's something that needs to be taken care of, yeah. you know, in the next year. Um, not that it'll be done in a year, but I think the planning process, and I think we need a lot of public input on something like that. But no, I think we got a lot done tonight, and it's good to get these two boards together, and uh, I think we can work things out. And we're going to keep Ben really, really busy. Uh, my comments will be echo what has been said. I think this was good. I think a lot of progress and, uh, was made with these two boards. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Okay, we 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 are watching. We did what? Three minutes. Guess <laughs> 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 that. on the floor again to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. Second. Okay.
Thank you so much. Y'all have a good night. You too. Thank you. I'll get it. One of these.